Dr. Barbara Sherry is a professor of virology and department head in molecular biomedical sciences at North Carolina State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, Barbara, thank you so much for speaking to me again. It's my pleasure. I want to make it clear that the reason we're speaking again is that we spoke almost three weeks ago and this current COVID-19 outbreak is a rapidly changing and evolving situation. So I think much of what we said then, um, we might talk about in a different manner today. There's so much has changed. So today is April 8th, 2020. And what we're discussing is using the best evidence we have up to today. Correct, it is changing daily. So, Let's start with some very basics. Could you tell me what a virus is and why we don't even consider it quite a life form? Well, vi it's a good question. Um, viruses, all they want to do is make more of themselves. They want to infect a host that could be an animal or a human, a chicken, uh, and replicate, amplify themselves, grow in that host, get out of that host, and infect another host. That's all they want to do. When we see disease, when we see symptoms, it's not because the virus, is, virus wants to do it. It's because this is how the virus is getting out of one host and into another host. It depends on that host. If it's just on uh, a tabletop, it can't make more of itself. It is dependent on your machinery, your cells, to make more of itself. So it's not exactly living but it does grow like a living thing, as long as it's got the means by uh, being basically a parasite on its host. And so then what you just said about what the virus wants, um, it just wants to reproduce. And so these symptoms that we experience, that's part of its mechanism for reproducing, is, is that? Is that when it's causing yeah. us to cough and it's causing us to be congested? That's the process that it that it initiates. Yeah, it, it's really pretty brilliant, right? Because by causing those symptoms and getting you to <clears throat> cough or uh, to have diarrhea or to vomit, you are expelling a lot of virus to another into the environment and potentially to another host. So it's it's pretty brilliant to cause symptoms. Uh, and since we just did uh, talk about a couple symptoms, um, we are talking mostly about a little bit about viruses in general, but mostly this new coronavirus that is causing the COVID-19 disease. So um, what can you say about this virus and the symptoms? So things we should be aware of and looking out for. What are the symptoms and, and what would you like to tell us about it to begin with? Well, uh, it can be so mild that we don't even notice that we're sick, or it can cause mild cough, mild fever, uh, or it can get very severe into the lower respiratory tract and cause a severe pneumonia and even death. So if you have a cough and a fever, right now you might suspect that it would be this virus. Uh, the symptoms can be very similar to flu. Uh, we're finally getting past the flu season, but for a while there, uh, it would have been difficult to distinguish between them. What determines how much someone is affected by the virus? Because we've heard some people, some people can die, some people just get sick, some people require hospitalization, others don't, and some people may never develop symptoms. So what are the factors that can determine that in an individual? Well, the uh, biggest factors are age, if you're elderly or if you're very, very young, and predisposing medical factors. So if you have some pre-existing condition like diabetes or a heart condition or a lung condition of some kind. Uh, the reason age is a factor, the reason the elderly are often, often succumb to this is that their immune system isn't as good as a younger person's. And so they're less able to fight it off. So they're more fragile. Now, the specific populations that are most vulnerable to this virus are not necessarily the same with other viruses. I heard that for the 1919 influenza, it preferentially affected healthy people between the ages of 20 and 40. 
Um, so what's that about? Uh, well, sometimes it, it can really depend on whether a group has seen it before. Uh, so for influenza, it's a little different because it's about a prior immune response uh, being helping to protect you. So it can be that, or it can even be that sometimes your immune response is working so hard and it is so robust that it causes some of the symptoms. You want to blame the virus. You want to say it's the virus that's making you so sick, but sometimes it's your own response fighting off the virus that's really making you feel so sick. It's, it's a good thing that, the, that you are fighting it off, but it can be those symptoms that you're so disturbed by. Can you tell me something about our body's defenses? Because of course, one of the big questions everyone has is, um, if you have the virus once, does that confer immunity on you afterwards? So uh, help me understand this whole subject about how does our body have defenses against a virus it's never seen before, and um, what? Are, how does that work, and how do vaccines work? Because I assume it's sort of related. Yes. So um, the, the first short answer is we really don't know for this virus, and we won't know whether a prior infection will protect you from a future infection until we have more time and we have more evidence. So that's the short answer about this virus. But for viruses in general, a virus infects you and you have an immediate response within minutes to hours where some very non-specific defense mechanisms are activated. And they're basically trying to hold things at bay while your more professional immune system, the bigger guns, are ramping up. Now, the first time you see a virus, it takes quite a while for that to happen, days to really weeks to really ramp up a strong immune response. And that immune response is very specific. It does a great job of completely clearing the virus for most viruses. Some viruses uh, don't get completely cleared, but for most viruses. And then you have memory. Your body actually keeps a little bit of that immune response in you. And so if you ever get infected with that virus again, it's ready to go. It's been, it's like it's on alert and it says, I know that virus. And so it ramps up very quickly. And now instead of it taking days to weeks, it can take hours to days. And you might not even know you're getting infected. You would say, well, I'm immune. I'm not infected. Uh, you might have been infected very, very briefly, but no symptoms. That's also how a vaccine works. When we give a vaccine, we're mimicking a natural infection. So without the symptoms and without the bad side effects, so that your immune system is fooled into making that immune response, remembering that virus that it thinks it had. And so if you get infected by that virus afterwards, it, get, it gets ramped up right away. And, and you would think that you are immune to that virus. Someone asked me if, if two identical twins were both exposed to the virus, would they necessarily respond the same way, have the same immune response? That's a really good question. There is a random aspect to your immune response, not, not random, uh, probabilistic is the way to think about it, about the way your immune system is shaped. And that might differ between identical twins. Also, identical twins are not exposed to identical environments. Uh, they're not kept holding hands their entire life, touching every dog the same way, uh, being exposed to every bit of soil the same way. And so the environment is going to play a role in shaping their immune response. So in many ways, they, they will be predisposed to the same kind of response but in many ways, the environment is going to shape their response. It's curious to me that, that dangerous viruses, such as this one, can be on certain parts of our body without causing any harm. So well, what is it about um, the different tissues or locations on our body that pink eye uh, is okay until it gets to your eye, and this coronavirus 
if it's on my hands, it's not dangerous to me. What, what determines how dangerous it becomes if it gets into my lungs? Well, we talked about how viruses need to replicate. They need to reproduce to make more of them. In order to do that, they have to get inside cells. And the way they get inside cells is not just some general, you know, just bang right in there. They have to actually get in through a door. We call that door a receptor. And they have to be able to unlock that door. So they have special proteins on their surface, the surface of the virus, that can, un that can interact with proteins or other molecules on the surface of your cell. And that interaction unlocks that door and allows the virus to get in. Once the virus gets in, it can, it can reproduce, and that's part of what's going to cause symptoms. Well, this virus doesn't get into, as far as we know, skin cells on your hand, but it does get into the cells that line your upper respiratory tract. And so it causes symptoms there because it reproduces in those cells. And so can you tell me about that receptor, and is it exclusively in those respiratory cells? Is it found anywhere else? Uh, it's found, it's actually found in a number of tissues in your body. It's called ACE2. Uh, it's found on the specialized cells that line your lung, the epithelial cells, but it's sound, found in some other cells as well. Remember, though, that the virus has to have a way of getting to those cells. So viruses have to be able to transit to the cell that has the door. How do viruses get to the lung? Well, we breathe them in. How would they get from the lung to another place in our body? Hmm, maybe the bloodstream. So the virus might need to get to other places in your body through the bloodstream or through your nerves uh, or through other ways of getting around your body. And that is very specialized for viruses. And so far, I haven't seen evidence of this virus transiting around the body that way. And you explained that when it gets into our lungs, it causes a response that involves congestion and coughing, and that helps it replicate. If it got into some of those other cells, would it necessarily even be able to become problematic in that well, way? Well, it, it might not be useful for the virus because unless it was your intestinal tract and so it was going to escape because you had diarrhea, uh, it, it wouldn't help the virus to escape and get to a new host, so it wouldn't necessarily be useful for the virus. Would it cause symptoms? Well, it might. There's two ways that I can think of right now that viruses cause symptoms. One is that the virus damages those cells. Just the act of the virus reproducing can, can damage the cell, can kill the cell. But the other is we talked about your immune response. That can actually be damaging. It's robust enough that part of what it has to do is kill the cells that are infected to keep those cells from reproducing the virus. Well, if your immune system is killing cells, that's pretty damaging. So whether or not those other tissues, if they got infected, would you have symptoms? It would depend whether the virus was killing enough cells, and it would depend on whether your immune response was so robust that it was killing cells. Are there, is there anything we know, are there any viruses that are actually beneficial to us or another species? Well, there are people who would argue, and this is going to surprise you, that some herpes viruses are good. Herpes viruses, what could possibly be good about them? Well, you know, there are, a lot of times they're inside you, and for big periods of time, you don't even know that you have a herpes virus. But your body knows that it has a herpes virus, and it can be priming it all the time to just be a little on the alert for infectious agents. So having herpes viruses might be a good thing for us because it keeps our immune system kind of on its toes. Let's talk about some uh, precautions and measures we can take to, to uh, prevent ourselves from getting the virus. Uh, it's kind of remarkable 
that so much emphasis has been placed on something as common as soap and washing our hands with soap. How, what's the mechanism there? How does soap protect us from the virus? Well, so soap is detergent and it turns out some viruses, uh, you see, you know, I didn't even talk about really what a virus is. A virus is a little tiny thing that you can think of as a bag. And inside that bag are the genes. Just like you have genes that code for all of you and who you are, viruses have genes that code for who they are. They're genetic material. So it is a bag that is surrounding the genetic material. Well, some viruses have very tough bags, but some viruses have very fragile bags. And this virus and coronaviruses in, ge in general have very fragile bags. And so that bag is very sensitive to detergent. If you can use detergent and literally pop that bag, you will make the virus so that it can no longer infect. So that's one way that washing your hands is an excellent way of getting rid of this virus and activating this virus. Another aspect of this is that when you wash your hands, you are rinsing them with a lot of water. And so you are diluting anything. You are diluting this virus so that if you have a certain amount of virus on your hands and you're washing your hands, whether it was virus or whether it's dirt, it's all going down the drain and it's no longer on your hands. So that is another important way that washing your hands helps. So actually there's the, the mechanical, physical washing away and then the soap actually is disruptive to its protective membrane. Um, yeah. And what about hand sanitizers and wipes? Um, and, and, and should we be using these and to what extent should we be using these? What's, what's your recommendation? Well, um, yes, we should be using them. Washing your hands with soap is the absolute best. If you have access to do that, by far that's the best because it's very effective. And as we talked about, the, the virus is going down the drain. You're, you're diluting the virus. You're washing it off you. But hand sanitizers, as long as they're better than 60 or 70 percent alcohol, uh, those can inactivate the virus as well. The only downside is making sure that you get all parts of your hands and that you're not diluting the virus. The virus is inactivated, but you haven't really moved it off your hands. Maybe some of it is now on the wipe and some of it is still on your hands. It's inactivated, but when you washed your hands, you had two things going on. When you use a hand sanitizer, you only have one thing going on. Do we have to fear that inactivated virus? No, no. Once it's inactivated, there is nothing to fear. Then, then, then why did you make that, uh, specify that difference? Well, how perfect are we when we use these hand sanitizers? Did we get every little nook and cranny? So having a backup system to get those last little nooks and crannies, like you have when you're washing your hands, that's very powerful. Since we're practicing, hopefully, very extreme social isolation um, and a lot of businesses are closed, um, deliveries for most of us have increased, whether it's from Amazon or groceries or a local restaurant. Is it safe to get these deliveries? And what can you say about the process we should follow uh, when receiving or picking up uh, deliveries and yeah. stuff like that. Well, that that's a very real a very real risk. Uh, first of all, there's the delivery person. If you're coming within six feet of that delivery person, even if they don't have symptoms, they could be what we call pre-symptomatic, which means they are about to come down with it, but they don't know it yet. And we do know that people who are pre-symptomatic do shed virus. They could be asymptomatic, which means they're infected, they are never going to get very severe symptoms, but they can also shed virus. So maintaining the six foot distance from your delivery person is first of all important. Uh, then you've got the packaging materials. A uh, recent study showed that this virus can survive on cardboard for maybe even a day or two. 
uh, on some surfaces, steel, uh, maybe even a little longer. It depends on the environment. I mentioned that this virus has a fragile bag or membrane. Uh, so if it's very dry out or very hot out, that might affect its ability to survive. But the best practice is to have the person put the materials down, step away, you pick up the materials, bring them into your house, put them on a known surface, a counter, for example, and then remove the, the materials to a clean place, a clean receptacle, and then wash your hands and get rid of those original outer materials. So you separated the people in your house and you from the original delivery materials. You know, when you and I talked three weeks ago, uh, here in the United States, there it had started to spread, it was a problem, but nothing like it is now. And the important point of that is that the more people are infected, the more likely it is that something that you are going to touch was touched by somebody who was shedding virus. So those kinds of practices are much more important now, now that it's so prevalent than they were even three weeks ago. Yeah, that's that's one key point that I was remembering from, from our interview as well, that at the time, not that many people in the United States had the virus. Uh, but now we have so many diagnosed cases. Can you say something about that? Um, as far as what we know and the numbers of uh, when we're assigning what percentage of people that contract the virus might die from it, um, what do we know and what's changed in these past couple months about um, how much testing we've done, what we actually know about the prevalence, and what does that actually, you know, our, our, our actual stats, how does that relate to the reality uh, well, beyond you know, we, our testing? So what... First of all, we're, we're testing as much as we can, given, in, given our limited supply of tests. So this is not at all uh, a, a blame game that people aren't testing. They should be testing because we're testing as much as we possibly can, given the limitation of our tests. Uh, clearly, a lot of people are not being tested. I just said that people can be infected and not have symptoms. Well, those people right now are not being tested. So we are definitely underestimating the number of people who are infected. How much are we underestimating them? Well, there's really only one way to know that for sure, and that is to do random testing, where you don't test people because they present a certain way. You test because you're just randomly sampling. You're sampling from cities. You're sampling from urban, from suburban, from rural areas. And that's where you get a real feel for how many people are actually infected, which will change over time. Now let's go back to the estimate of the death rates. If we don't know how many people are actually infected, well, we definitely know how many people are dying. And the people who are dying, we are pretty, they've been tested and we can be pretty confident they've been tested and they were dying because of the virus. So that's a pretty firm number. But when you say the percent death or the death rate, we have half of that number. We have, we're confident of our deaths, but we're not confident of, in our infection rate. And so it's an incomplete number. If we say the death rate is 2%, 3%, that's based on our known number of infections. But we know that we are vastly underestimating the number of, of infections that are truly out there. Given that people can be asymptomatic and be carrying the virus, I've heard of some theme parks and grocery stores uh, talking about or already instituting a policy where they would take someone's temperature before they enter the store or theme park. What do you think of that as a precaution? Well, you know, we always try to do the best we can given the circumstances. I'm sure that they would love to actually have a perfectly accurate test. And that's and if they had that opportunity, they would use it. But they don't. So they're doing the next best thing. They're using something that 
we know happens if you have a severe infection, which is, or even a mild infection, you get a fever. The problem with it is that you don't get a fever for a few days. And so uh, you could be infected and either pre-symptomatic or infected and asymptomatic, not have a fever and still be shedding virus. So they're going to miss some people who are infected. The good news is they're going to find some people who are infected who did not know they were infected, did not realize they had a fever, and at least they're identifying those people. So good for them that they're trying to do it. They're doing the best they can. They're also raising public awareness. There are still people out there walking around thinking that this is no big deal. And so this is letting those people know that we're taking this seriously. One thing I would be concerned about is that if somebody, if they only let people in that don't have a fever, that people, once they're inside, might feel like everything's okay because they tested without realizing it. Uh, it's one level of precaution, but it's not perfect. This is very true, and, and we're always nervous about that. Whatever we're doing, uh, it, it, it makes it so people have their guard down because they think that they're now safe. But from what I've seen in grocery stores, uh, people are being very nervous. So uh, I, I think most of the U.S., a lot of the U.S. has gotten the message so far. I'm really pleased that a lot of states have, have uh, gone into somewhat lockdown efforts, uh, lockdown orders, because I really think that social distancing is a very important part of how we're controlling this virus. And about social distancing, and you mentioned uh, in case of a delivery, when you do encounter someone, that six feet, how do we come up with that six feet? And what does that mean? Well, they did not come up with that six feet necessarily for this virus in particular, but there have been longstanding studies that have shown the distance when you cough, how far can your droplets, those respiratory droplets that contain the virus, how far can they travel? So that's where those estimates come from, is what is the likely, and not only how far can they travel, but how far can they travel and then be likely to infect you? So there's a long standing history of, of experiments that backs up the, that recommendation. Is there any bad advice that you've seen out there that bothered you, that you, anything you heard as a, as a precaution or anything that, that just struck you as, that disturbed you? Where do I begin? <laughs> well, I, first of all, I will say that most of the alcoholic beverages that you drink, even if you reach for them straight from your shelf, do not contain a high enough alcohol content that if you mix them with a little bit of aloe gel or whatever it is that you're mixing them with, that they will still have a sufficiently high alcohol content to inactivate this virus. So please don't make hand sanitizer out of your vodka. That's probably my least favorite. Uh, there are, I, I would say that's the biggest one. The others are just, uh, they're just a little wild. I don't even know how to address them. In terms of social distancing, a lot of people have taken it. What's your advice? Should people just be staying home? A lot of people are like, oh, social distancing. That means I can go out as much as I want as long as I stay six feet away from people. Well, every time you go out, you're taking a risk. Uh, every time you pass someone, uh, you, you go on a, a running path. And you're being very careful that when you run, you're running in the opposite direction of someone and you're only passing each other for a second. You are only within a few feet of that person for a second. Well, if they were breathing out heavily at the same time you were breathing in deeply and they were infected, you've just exposed yourself. So staying home is the absolute safest thing you can do. It's the best thing and it's what you should be doing most of the time. If you need to go out, and thank you to our frontline workers who are going out every day and doing it at their own risk and doing it to protect the rest of us or to feed the rest of us, our grocery clerks or 
uh, to deliver our mail or whatever it is, the people who are providing essential services for us, thank you because you're putting yourself at risk. Uh, every time you go out, you're putting yourself at risk because not only might you get close enough to somebody that may be asymptomatic but could breathe the virus and, and leave it in the air for you to breathe in, but you also, we're human, we touch things. It's very hard for us to not touch things. You go to a store and you touch a doorknob and you you go to an aisle and you touch the, the can that somebody else just touched. Well, the likelihood that they touched their face and got the virus on their hand and then touched that exact same can that you touched and that you got it, that's a very low probability, right? People should not get paranoid about this, but it's still a risk. The safest thing you can do is stay in your house. Recently, our CDC, the Center for Disease Control, changed their recommendation regarding masks. Um, in some cultures, in Asian cultures, in Japan especially, they've, they've had a culture of mask wearing going back maybe even decades. Um, can you tell me about that? Was was it a mistake to tell us not to wear masks? And could you differentiate between the N95 and all other masks? Um, what what, what sure. should we think about them? Sure. Well, first of all, no, it was not a mistake. Uh, you know, everything that, when CDC comes out with a new recommendation, it's based on the fact that they have new information. It's not that they just changed their mind. So they do have new information. But let's back up a little bit. What happened when this virus first started to break in the United States is a lot of ordinary people went out and bought a lot of masks. And in fact, that was happening around the world. And that created a dramatic shortage of masks for the people who really need it. They need, need a mask, our frontline workers, particularly our people in, in the hospitals, our nurses, our doctors, our hospital staff. So we created a shortage because so many people tried to get masks even though they didn't really need the masks. So what kind of masks are there? There's, I'll, I'll break it down into three kinds. There's the N95s that are sometimes called respirator masks. Those fit very closely to your face. In fact, they're supposed to be professionally fitted. They're supposed to your face has a slightly different shape than mine. What's going to fit, if you've ever worn goggles, if you've ever gone scuba diving or something like that, you know that you need a really tight fit or the water is going to get in. Those masks are actually supposed to be uh, fitted and you're supposed to use a brand and a size that would fit you well. Because the idea is they fit close up against your face and air, when you breathe in, it is filtered through a, a very good filter. So those are very uh, effective masks. Uh, they're very important for people who are dealing with patients who are actively um, expiring the virus. They're coughing and the virus is coming out of them. The people dealing with that should be wearing N95s. I don't need an N95. You don't need an N95. We're not three feet or two feet from somebody who is coughing out a lot of virus. The next kind of virus, I mean, the next kind of mask would be maybe a surgical mask. That's the thing you typically see on uh, medical shows, you know, when you're watching a hospital show and you see people with these sort of blue things and they're tied back or they have elastic, that's a surgical mask. Those are good. They don't fit tightly, but they do a good job because of those pleats. They kind of fit around your face and they do a pretty good job. What they do a great job at is if I cough, when I cough, it all gets trapped in the mask. So those are fantastic for people who are infected. Those masks are great for keeping those infected people from spreading the virus to other people. That is why originally the CDC and many others said there's no point in the ordinary person wearing a mask. Because when I wear one of those surgical masks, the best thing it's doing is keeping me from coughing virus out. 
So if, if a surgical mask is good at protecting people from coughing out virus, why isn't it great at protecting me from breathing in the virus? And the reason is, I told you that you, you wear it on your face, but it's not a very tight fitting mask. We do a good job with those pleats, getting it kind of covering up around, but there are still little air pockets. And think when you breathe in, some of that air is gonna come through the mask, but path of least resistance, some of it is gonna come in those little air pockets. So it's not perfect. Not perfect, that's still better than nothing. And that's why eventually CDC is saying, yeah, wear that mask. It's definitely better than nothing. But CDC is saying, not saying wear a surgical mask because we are still in short supply of surgical masks. And please, the ordinary person should not be going out there trying to find surgical masks. That brings me to our third kind of mask, and that's a cloth mask. These are easy to make at home if you have a needle and thread. But honestly, you can even just take a bandana and, and use that. And a cloth mask is, again, going to protect you from those respiratory droplets that you're breathing in. The better you can get it to fit around your face, the more protective it's going to be. So the CDC's latest recommendation that you wear a mask at all times when you're out in public, but that you make you, you get yourself a cloth mask is a great compromise. It's it's certainly better than nothing, and it doesn't deplete our precious supply of surgical masks. But we shouldn't feel invulnerable just because we're wearing it. No. And that uh, is the worry. That The worry is that because you're wearing a mask, you think you're now invulnerable. And it's just like the worry when you're using hand sanitizer or anything. Look, the only way you're protected is just stay home. My neighbor just went out to take his dog for a walk the other day and he was wearing a mask and I asked him why because I knew that in all likelihood he wasn't going to come anywhere near any other humans. And he said two reasons. He said, one, it, uh, it prevents me from touching my face as much anyway. And the other was that it helps people seeing me wear the mask it helps uh, uh, us get over the stigma of mask wearing. Whereas like in Japan, it's so common that there is no weirdness about it. But here in the United States, it's still a strange sight. And I think people have feelings about, about whether they're going to wear a mask or not. So he consciously, those were his, two, what do you think of that? Those were his two reasons I, I, for your, choosing Your neighbor to. is a very smart guy. So uh, first of all, it's absolutely true that the way we can... You know, if I touch a handrail and it's a contaminated handrail and I get the virus on my hands, I'm safe. I'm not infected until I do this. And then when I touch my face, I've now taken that virus from the handrail and I've put it right where it needs to go, my nasal passages or my, my uh, respiratory tract. And I've given it, I have been the transit that brought the virus into myself. I was my own worst enemy. So your neighbor is absolutely right. Wearing a mask is great because it keeps us humans from touching our faces, which we all do. And it is a very hard habit to break. The other point about stigma is a really good one. Uh, it's true that in a lot of Asian countries, there is no stigma to wearing a mask. But here, when people see you with a mask, they think you're contagious because that's when we usually wear it, is when we are contagious. Sometimes severely immunocompromised people wear them, but then they, they feel like they're drawing attention to themselves. So until the CDC just said everybody should be wearing a mask, if you walk down the street and you saw somebody in a mask, you might be nervous and think, well, that person must be infected, otherwise why would they be wearing a mask? Does the virus have a way to get around? Like, how, how does it get to where it wants to be? And if, if I bring it up to my face, uh, how does it make that last leap to get, do I, do, like, to get into my lungs? Well, the best way the virus has of traveling is when we cough. Because when we cough, we are like a little jet propulsion machine. We're sending it in respiratory droplets and the virus likes damp. It likes to stay damp. That's what keeps it protected. We're sending it in, in little droplets over to you, and then you're 
breathing it in, that's just person to person. That is the most effective way for the virus to be transmitted from one host to another host. But another very effective way is eventually those droplets, by gravity, they fall and they land on something. They land on a handrail, they land wherever. Or I'm asymptomatic or presymptomatic. I don't know that I'm shedding virus. I touch my face and then I touch a handrail. Either way, whether it's because the respiratory droplets fell on the handrail or I took them from my face and put them on the handrail, now they're waiting. And then an uninfected person comes along, touches that handrail, and brings it up to their face. That is a very effective way of bringing it into your nose. And once, once it's in your nose, it's home free. You breathe in, you're breathing it into your lungs. What is a zoonotic virus? A zoonotic virus is a virus that spreads from animals to humans. It's that simple. Very simple. So, um, but there are a lot of questions to follow up with because so, so, uh, is that common? Are, are all viruses zoonotic? Um, and what, what happens that makes it make that leap to another species? Well, first of all, only a very small fraction of viruses are zoonotics. Uh, there's a lot of viruses out there that are in animals, and we don't even know that they have the potential to be zoonotics because we never even encounter them. They're deep inside a rainforest. They're in a bat we're never going to encounter. And so we don't know they're a zoonotic because they've actually never met up with a human. To cross species means that they have to be able to get into a human cell. Remember, we talked about that the virus needs to be able to reproduce. To do that, it has to get into your cell. To get into your cell, it has to be able to open that door. That door is a receptor, a protein, or another small molecule on the surface of your cell. And that means that that virus that was in an animal and normally enters an animal cell using an animal cell door now has to uh, be able to use a variation on that door. Some of our proteins on our cells are very similar to the ones that are on other animals. Uh, obviously for primates, we're close, most closely related. Uh, you can go further and further down the evolutionary line and we're further and we're less and less related. Some of them are very conserved over long periods of evolutionary history, some of them not so much. So for a virus to make the leap from an animal to a human, one of the first things it needs to do is to be able to use a human cell receptor. Then once it gets inside the cell, it doesn't do all the work by itself. It actually uses the cell's machinery and that's a partnership. So again, it has to be able to interact with the cell's proteins and the cell's machinery. Again, it used to do it in some animal, now it has to be able to do it in a human cell. That's a pretty big leap. Can you tell me something about the taxonomy of coronaviruses? Because I understand there are many, we've got related ones. How, how big a family is this? Well, it's a, it's a very large family. So coronaviruses are a family and there are subdivisions in that family and each subdivision has many different viruses. So, so why do we say they're different viruses? What makes a virus different from another virus? If they're all coronaviruses, why do we say they're different from each other? Well, we know down to the atomic level, down to the sequence, we know that they're different, but they also behave differently. Some of them can infect cats, some dogs, some pigs, some chickens. Some of them cause predominantly respiratory symptoms. Others cause predominantly gastrointestinal sy symptoms. So they're very different viruses, even though they're all in the same family, and we call them all coronaviruses. So now let's talk about the group of coronaviruses that are most related to the current one that causes COVID-19. Um, in particular, just can you give me some context of what, what happened with 
uh, the MERS and SARS outbreaks. And really what I'm getting at is, is towards the origin of the virus. Um, but I'd like to hear a little bit about those first. Okay, well, the first major coronavirus outbreak that we had was the original SARS outbreak, and that was in the early 2000s, uh, I think 2002. And it came from an exotic, uh, a wet market, which means an, um, a market that sells live animals that are not your normal domesticated animals, they're exotic animals. Uh, and so we learned that the virus came from something called a civet cat, which is not what you think of when you're really thinking of a cat. It's a little different. But really, when we were able to investigate it further, we learned it came from bats. And so it had gone from a bat to probably a civet cat and from there to humans. And then once it adapted to humans, it spread, it spread very effectively. Uh, it caused a bad respiratory uh, disease, and it killed a lot of people. That was the original one. Then in around 2008, there was another outbreak, and that was the virus called MERS, M-E-R-S. And that one, we know it was in the Middle East. That's why it's called MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, it came from a camel, came from camels to humans. But again, the camels were not the original host. Uh, came from bats, from bats into camels, into humans. Uh, and the camel story is a little interesting because uh, it, it came, spread from the camels to the humans because the humans, the, the, in, in the Middle East, a lot of people have very personal relationships with their camels. They're beasts of burden. They really depend on them for their work and their livelihood. But they're also... They have very close and, and long relationships with them, and they are very intimate with those animals. They snuggle with them. Uh, and so that's probably part of how it spread from the camels to the humans. I wouldn't think people had the same relationship with those civet cats. I wonder, how did it get no. from the civet cat <laughs> into humans? Uh, probably contam just contamination, hands, things like that, just wet stuff. And what do we know about the origin of this new coronavirus? Well, we know that it, it, it almost definitely came from a bat. Now, how do we know that? Well, we can sequence the genetic material of these viruses. And part of you know, the, the fact that their sequences are very similar is what helps us group them into families. Uh, but there are a lot of subtleties to those sequences. So in a family, we would say the family of coronaviruses all have similar sequences. Well, similar just means a certain amount of similarity. It's like you might look similar to a relative. You look closer to maybe your dad than you do to your grandfather. We can talk about that similarity, and we can use that similarity to trace where a virus came from. So just like Ancestry.com or something like that, where you're looking to say, what am I most closely related to? We can do that with viruses. And do, using that, we can figure out that this virus is incredibly closely related. This SARS-2 uh, coronavirus is incredibly closely related to a bat virus we've known for quite a while. So we are very confident it came from that bat. Now, we don't know whether it came directly from the bat into humans or whether there was an animal intermediate like the civet cat was for SARS, the original SARS, and like the camel was for MERS. Why bats? Uh, MERS, SARS, and this one. I know they're related, but, but why are bats this common source for these viruses? Well... Bats actually are infected with many different coronaviruses, coronaviruses we don't even know about yet. And those coronaviruses don't make the bats sick. We don't really know why. We have some theories. Uh, but the bat just doesn't really seem to care that the coronavirus is in it. A given bat might be infected with as many as six different coronaviruses. Those coronaviruses can recombine and can 
make new coronaviruses, and they're just waiting to exploit an opportunity to jump into a new location. So the bat is like a little incubator, constantly spitting out not only the, the original coronaviruses that infected it, but new combinations of coronaviruses. And when we bring those bats into our environment, like at wet markets, or indirectly with anim through animals that were exposed to those bats, or we encroach on our rainforests and bring the bats into our backyards, uh, we are exposing ourselves to those coronaviruses. There will be more of them. So we have sequenced uh, the genome of this virus. Um, are we able to tell whether a virus has been bioengineered or not? Sure. We can, well, what we can do is we can say, what does the entire virus look like? Let's look at the whole sequence. When we did that, we said, all right, it is really, really similar to that bat virus out there. So we have no reason to believe that it came from anywhere else. Okay, well, what about instead, if somebody took a different coronavirus, maybe the original SARS virus or the MERS virus or some other bat virus, and they engineered it to look like this. Well, no, because those viruses look different all throughout the, a long genetic material. And those viruses have little changes all throughout them. So if you tried to engineer here or here, it would still have the signature over here of that bat virus I'm talking about. When we look at that one bat virus, and I say that that virus is the origin you can look all along that very complicated sequence and see the hallmarks all along there that that was the origin. If you look at any other coronavirus, you would have to make hundreds, if not thousands of changes to make it look like the coronavirus, the, the SARS-2 coronavirus. Does that make sense? It does. And if, if we make changes bioengineer gene do gene editing is there evidence that you can see of that editing in the same way that you can see when someone's a professional can see if a photo has been edited well i'm going to answer that in two different ways if you show me a virus that was bioengineered and you say to me what are the hallmarks that it was bioengineered if it was bioengineered it usually has pieces that were bioengineered. You don't bioengineer the whole thing at once. It, it, not only, it, I think that's near impossible to do, you take pieces of it and you swap in and out. And so I can spot an engineered virus because I can see that it's got a piece swapped in here and a piece swapped in there. But it's still it's engineered because it's still got that other part that looks like that bat virus from way over there. When we look at this virus, the SARS-2 coronavirus, it looks like the bat virus all throughout it. It doesn't have any parts of it that look like they were swapped in. What do we know about the possibility that uh, the new coronavirus could be carried by our pets, dogs and cats in particular, but other animals as well? Uh, well, when we spoke about three weeks ago, we knew very little. We actually know a lot more now. Uh, we know that it can infect cats. It, and we know that first because there were two or three cats that were found to have, to have the virus in them when they were in the household of a severely infected person. Those pets uh, had no, there were, there were uh, two or three dogs or two or th and two or three cats. Only one of those pets had any symptoms at all and recovered. Uh, now, when you think about the, the millions of infections of, and human, of humans around the planet right now, and I have to tell you, about maybe two or three dogs and two or three cats. I think that tells you 
that the frequency with which our pets might be infected is probably very, very low. And on top of that, only one of the cases I know of did the pet have symptoms. So the first lesson is that your pets are safe from you, but if you are, they can be infected. So if you are coughing and have a fever and you have been told that you likely have this virus, isolate yourself from your pets, just like you would isolate yourself from any family member. Don't snuggle with your pets because you might, you might infect your pet. We now have more direct information because uh, there was an excellent scientific study done where they deliberately infected cats or tried to infect cats, dogs, ferrets, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, uh, pigs, and chickens because they wanted to try and find out whether these animals could be infected and could be a source of spreading the virus to humans. Well, pigs and chickens didn't get infected. So our food, our food animals are good. They're safe. Uh, dogs, very hard to infect them, very minimal infection. We know that dogs can be infected because there were a couple that were infected by their owners, but it's probably very infrequent. But cats was a different story. They were able to infect the cat. And importantly, when they infected the cat and put the cat in a cage and had that caged cat next to another cage that had a cat, so those cats were not touching each other, they were not sharing food, they were not licking each other, they were only sharing air. The infected cat was able to transmit the virus to the uninfected cat. So that tells us that cats can not only get infected, but they can transmit the virus to other cats. We also now know uh, that in Wuhan, the Chinese city where this originally uh, broke out, they looked to see just feral cats, cats that are wandering the streets that don't have any owners. They asked, were those cats ever infected? And they could do that by looking at the cat's immune response. They don't have to find the virus in the cat, they can just say, do you have that memory? We talked about immune memory. If you've ever been infected by a virus, your immune system has a memory of it. And they asked, do these wild, these feral cats, these cats that have no home, do they have a memory of a viral infection? And about 14 or 15 percent of them did. So 14 out of every 100 cats had a memory. So we know that the cats can be infected. But most cats don't have symptoms, and there is absolutely no evidence that infected cats can transmit the virus back to humans. So we have no evidence to think that you are not safe from your pet. Does, the final story I want to tell, because it's been recently in the news, is the Bronx Zoo. There was a tiger that had respiratory symptoms, a dry cough and a fever. And then pretty soon, some other tigers and a handful of lions also had respiratory symptoms. And they figured out, they determined that the handler, the zookeeper, uh, had been pre-symptomatic. He later came down with, with COVID-19. And they believed that he was the source of the infection. Well, those big cats, they were infected. They had some symptoms. They were mild and they've recovered since then, they're doing fine. So, and we have no evidence that they transmitted it back to any humans. So I would say that on average, transmission to pets and between pets is a very small and infrequent part of this story. Nobody should fear their pets. Everybody should feel, you know, take solace. I mean, in this social isolation, world right now, where you're staying at home all the time, your best friend is your best friend, right? This is your, your dog who's always been by your side could be your only companion right now. And there is no reason to fear that animal. Uh, but if you get infected and you are coughing and have a fever, let somebody else take care of your pet. I wonder what's next for us 
Um, do you feel like the extent to which we've implemented social distancing and lockdowns uh, has been effective? I, I saw that in China, they just a few days ago relaxed the lockdown and the next day I saw photos of thousands of people packed in tightly in public spaces. Um, am I wrong to be horrified by that? Yeah, that is very scary. Uh, so there are epidemiologists out there who are using very powerful approaches to answer your question. So they're using mathematical modeling. And these, they're not just using one tool or one approach, they're using many different ones. And then they come up with predictions only when they use many different models and they all give them the same answer. And those models suggest that our social distancing is working and that it's worked in other places where it's, it's working in other places where it's been implemented and it is flattening our curve, which just means we're not all getting infected at once. And the reason that's so important is so that we don't overwhelm our healthcare systems. So flattening the curve is, work, is working. But picture it, if you ease it up and you let, suddenly let everybody start interacting again, all it takes is a few infected individuals and they infect, each one of them infects two or three people and each one of them infects two or three people we could be right back where we were in no time if we released if, if we released this social distancing, whether it is mandated or whether people are just doing it voluntarily because they understand that it's the right way to control the virus. We could be right back where we were. Do you have any idea of what, what the amount of time uh, should be before we relax those restrictions? Well, the modelers, these epidemiologists and computational uh, specialists uh, are rightfully, their tools are most accurate when they use them for the shortest period of time. So what they've been doing predominantly, uh, work that I've seen, has been focusing on uh, what if we do release, um, for example, a lot of places have lockdowns through April 30th. What happens if we release and let people do go about their business on May 1st? Or what if we extend it another month? And the results are dramatically different. So I haven't seen results where they've gone out much further than that because their the reliability decreases the longer they go out. Uh, but certainly talking about another month, the month of May, being heavily restricted, it, in my opinion, and based on these models, that's a good idea. So we've talked about so much. Um, uh, what would you like to leave me with as a, as a takeaway, uh, as some final thoughts on the whole subject about the COVID-19 outbreak? Well, I would say I, I thank you for coming to me and asking me about this because uh, I'm a virologist. And I base my knowledge on facts, things that have been experimentally proven. That is that they've been reproduced under carefully controlled scientific, uh, in, in carefully controlled scientific studies. I rely on people who are even greater experts than me to be doing those studies. And then I, those get reviewed by people who are experts. And that's how we know that what I'm telling you is true, and I'm always very careful to say things like, there is no evidence of this, or we don't know that yet. Uh, we introduced this saying it was April 8th. I'm gonna say it again, it's April 8th, because this is what we know as of today. But everything that we've been, we've, we now know about COVID-19, and all of our efforts to slow the spread of the virus, and to combat the virus, whether it's through drugs or through developing vaccines, are based on careful scientific study. And I worry that our country is moving away from understanding how important it is to base our, our behaviors and our uh, plans on careful scientific study. We have to follow science and medicine. We can't just 
wish or hope or fear. We have to base our actions and our plans on facts. And for the non-scientist, what would you be because there are so many possible sources of information, where do you think the non-scientist should turn for dependable information? Uh, thank you. CDC.gov is a very good source. Okay, well, thank you again for taking this much time to answer my many questions. And um, I think you have just enough time to get ready for your class. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. And as things develop, I actually really appreciate that you came back to me for updates because you and I were both getting increasingly uncomfortable. Um, I think that probably there's going to be less changing. We're in a much more knowledgeable state now than we were so it's kind of like exponential. The difference between now and three weeks ago is like this. Uh, but the difference between now and three weeks from now is going to be much less. Uh, but please feel free. Uh, we can follow up with email. We can follow up with whatever. You can even, we can make it easy where I answer things by email so that you're able to just insert you talking and say, and I've had an update to that part where, you know, whatever. Uh, but I'm, I'm passionate about making sure that what we're doing is sharing facts, not, not what was true yesterday, but what was, what's true today. Me too. So yeah, thank you again. And uh, I'm sure you will be hearing from me again. <laughs> all right, good. Well, take care and let me you know. Uh, I hope that all of this worked out and that it doesn't have too much of a crackly sound. Yeah, I think it's fine. And I think I can get some help to clean it up if, if I can't do it myself, but yeah, thanks. Perfect. All right. Take care. Be safe. Take care. You too. Stay safe. Wash those hands.